Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study on the road to Calvary. This is book two, entitled, We Would See Jesus, and this is chapter seven, which will be called, Seeing Jesus as the Way. Now, the picture of the Lord Jesus as the door properly belongs to the beginning of the Christian life. It is preeminently the message which the unregenerate man needs to hear when, under conviction of sin, he desires to return to God and find his salvation. We have, however, applied this picture of the door in a previous chapter to the needs of the believer, because he is sometimes so cold and defeated, and has been for so long, that when ultimately he gets right with the Lord, the entrance into more abundant life is an important crisis for him. In any case, the principles of grace revealed by the door are for him ever afterwards. The entrance for him into further blessing is through Jesus Christ our Lord and must be entered by repentance and faith. It will, however, save the reader from confusing the imagery if, as he reads the present chapter, he regards the picture of the door as applying either to the beginning of the Christian life or to some further crisis experience. What follows now applies to the Christian life itself after entrance by the door and is concerned with how to continue in the experience of grace into which we have entered. Now, what lies beyond the door? Scripture could have pictured the door leading us into a house or a garden. If it had done so, we would have gathered that the Lord Jesus brings us into a static experience of salvation, peace, and holiness, and that once having entered in, we would more or less stay there, enjoying it all without continuous cooperation on our part. Scripture, however, gives us the picture of the door leading us, not into a house, but onto a way. Said the Lord Jesus, Narrow is the gate, and straighten the way that leads unto life. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. The gate opens onto a way that stretches right ahead. And the Lord Jesus, who had said, I am the door, now says, I am the way that lies beyond the door. Both door and way are the same blessed person. Now a way speaks not of a final, settled blessing, but rather of a walk, of an experience which is continuous. A walk is simply a reiterated step where something is happening each moment in the present. After one step, the next step. After the one now, the next now. This illustrates the fact that our experience of Christ is to be a continuous, present tense, a glorious now. This moment, we are to be at peace with God through Jesus. And after this moment, the next moment in living fellowship with him, and thus the next moment and soon. Here, past crisis do not help us. The door experience was essential, but is now past. We may be able to testify that we were saved or sanctified on such a date, but God does not want us to be continually harking back to that moment in our mind, but instead to be living with him each moment in the present, where he will be to us all that we need. Now a walk like that requires that there should be a way on which to walk. As we drive easy along on our modern paved highways, we can hardly imagine the almost impassable terrain that confronted our fathers when they sought to make their way through a country where there were no roads. Whenever an undeveloped country is being opened up, the first thing to be done is always to build highways. The best automobiles in the world are valueless 
without these roads. And we have only to contemplate for a moment the fact that we are called to walk in continuous present tense fellowship with God to find ourselves asking how. How can people like ourselves, in circumstances like those in which we are, enjoy a continuous walk like that? With evil propensities within us and sin all around us, we are faced with what looks like an impassable swamp. We need a way, and a way of such an order that foolish wayfaring men like ourselves may walk thereon in peace and safety. God has provided for us such a way. He who provided for us the door has not failed to provide the way we so much need after we have entered by the door. It was foretold long before, and prophets like Isaiah eagerly looked forward to it. Said Isaiah, A highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but the redeemed shall walk thereon. Isaiah 35, verse 8. That way, consecrated for people like ourselves, is the Lord Jesus himself. For he said, I am the way. On either side are the swamps of sin. But stretching through them and above them is our highway exactly suited to our faltering feet, the Lord Jesus himself. This was the conception that the early Christians had of the Christian life. In the Acts of the Apostles, they always referred to what they had found in the Lord Jesus as a way. On no less than six occasions, Christianity is referred to there as the way. You'll find this in Acts chapter 9 verse 2. 19 verse 9 and 23, chapter 22 verse 4, chapter 24 verse 14 and 22. Indeed, in the book of Acts, it bears no other name. To them, Jesus was not only their door, but he was their way, on whom and with whom they were continuously and delightedly walking. The door then speaks of the beginning of or the crisis, while the way speaks of the going on. Both are fully provided for in the Lord Jesus. Now, if there is one thing more important than entering by the door, it is going on in the way. Having entered by the door, the walk is going to occupy us right to the end of our days. But it is just this which is our greatest difficulty. Compared with the ease with which we entered by the door, the walk seems hard indeed. It seems difficult to maintain that fresh fellowship with God which was so vivid when we began. It is hard to maintain his peace in our here. It seems difficult to make the means of grace work. And prayer, the Bible, and worship become unreal to us. We find it difficult to be effective witnesses for Jesus and to manifest the sweetness and holiness that we know we should. The truth is that many of us who have entered by the door are not really walking the way at all. Though we still have our faces Zionwards, we have slipped off the highway that has been divinely cast up, and we are painfully dragging our steps through the swamp that abounds on either side. Sometimes I have heard a Christian apply to himself the expressive word stuck when he is in that condition. Basically, this difficulty is due to the fact that we are not seeing Jesus as the way, but we are trying to make other things the way, and they just do not work. Some feel that prayer is the most important thing in the Christian life and it becomes the way for them. Others would put Bible study in that place, others fellowship, others personal witnessing, yet others the church and the sacraments, and yet others Christian neighborliness. It is felt that if we do these things, then we shall be really living the full Christian life, and we thus make them the way. 
None of these things, however, is the way. And they only make the Christian life hard and barren when we try to make them such, even in a small degree. First, they have no answer to sin. And sin is the Christian's problem all of the time. Satan knows how to provoke our hearts to wrong reactions. Prayer, witnessing, fellowship, church going, Bible study, and so on do not cleanse nor give the guilty conscience peace. That which does not anticipate and have an answer for the sin that comes can never be the way for the Christian. Then the value of these things depends on our doing them. But the doing is just our difficulty. We find we cannot do them, at least not as our conscience tells us they ought to be done. And because we fail to do them, they fail to bring us into the peace that we need. Or if we think we have done them as they should be done, then they undo all the good they might have brought us by begetting in us the terrible sin of pride. Not only, however, do they not bring us into peace, but the seeking of spiritual life by works can be positively harmful in another way. The unattained standards and the unfulfilled duties burden and condemn the conscience. And we sigh and we drag our steps under the load. Paul was alluding to just this experience when he said, The commandment which was ordained to life, if I could keep it, I found to be unto death, because I failed to keep it. Romans chapter 7 verse 10. The man who says, I believe in prayer, or I believe in witnessing, or in anything else will invariably end by being cursed by the very things in which he professes to have such faith, because sooner or later he is bound to fall down on those very things. Then his unattained standards will only nag him and he will be in bondage to them. As many as are of the works of the law are always under a curse. For according to moral law, cursed is every man who continues not in all things of the law, in which he professes to believe, in which he professes to do. This is found in Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. The only one we can believe in without being cursed is Jesus, because he has come to redeem us from the curse of our unattained standards, having been made a curse for us on Calvary. Galatians 3.13 Only the Lord Jesus himself is the way. To attempt to walk on any other is to fall and to despair. This does not mean that we are not to do these things, of course, they are to occupy a prominent place in the Christian's life. But it does mean to say that they are not the way, as so often we make them. The Lord Jesus himself is the only way. None else will suit our stumbling feet. Someone at this point may object that he does not regard these things as the way itself, but only as a way to Christ who is the true way. There is, however, no way to Christ, for Christ himself is the way. We do not need a way to the way. It is that little way to the way that defeats us and makes the real way of none effect to us, because we cannot get there. In the early days of railways in Britain, some towns refused to have the railways go through them because they feared that the sparks from the engine would set their property on fire. Instead, the station was set on the outskirts of the town, to the immense inconvenience of later generations of townsmen. Not so this way, which is Christ, for it runs right by us in our need and poverty, and we can end him as we are and where we are. To say otherwise is to rob the gospel of its sweetness and its power. We cannot but ask at this point, where do the means of grace come in then? What is their proper place? 
Here we could not do better than quote from a recent writing from Reverend Wesley Nelson of Oakland, California, both as making this point clear and as summarizing much that has been already said. And he quotes, Because prayer is revitalized through fellowship with Christ, there is a tendency to look upon prayer as a way to Christ and to try vainly to pray more fervently in order to come closer to Christ. The Bible witnesses to Jesus, and when Jesus is near, the Bible is a new book. Therefore, some torment themselves for not reading or studying it more faithfully in order to know him better. Christ is the way to the Bible, as he is to prayer. The Spirit of Christ himself must speak through the pages of the scriptures before they can become meaningful. The time of daily personal devotions becomes a more blessed experience to those who know Christ intimately. Sometimes this tends to be looked upon as a way to Christ, and the responsibility to keep it only adds to the burden of a troubled conscience. The sheep do not come to the still waters to find the shepherd. It is the shepherd himself who leads them beside the still waters. Jesus Christ is immediately available right where we are and as we are. He in turn becomes the way to these various means of worship. He leads us into those forms of personal devotion and worship which are most adapted to each one's spiritual needs. Unquote. If, however, we have not a continuing devotional life with the Lord, expressing itself in prayer and feeding on his word, it is because we have become spiritually cold and have got out of touch with the Lord. This is perhaps the surest index of where we are spiritually at any given time. In such a case, the remedy is not to make a new attempt to pray and read the Bible more regularly, but instead to go direct to the Lord Jesus himself, to repent of the coldness and of the things that have caused it, and to receive from him again his cleansing. Then it is that prayer and the study of his word are suffused once more with the glory of his presence and now become a delight, and our witness to others becomes fresh and spontaneous. It is as simple as that. In this way, we find Jesus to be the way to our devotions, rather than our devotions the way to him, except in so far that in getting right with him, we do actually pray and read our Bibles, and in dealing with God, he invariably uses his word to speak to us. Let us look now more positively at Jesus as the way. Apart from him, the sinner is faced with an excluding wall and the saint with impassable swamps. Both wall and swamps symbolize the same thing, sin. If it is sin, then, that blocks the sinner's entrance, it is sin that impedes the saint's progress. With sin around him in the world and sin within him in his heart, how can he hope to walk in fellowship with God? If the sinner needs a door, the saint needs a way, a highway that has been cast up, a way that has been prepared, along which he can walk in rest, joy, and power through, or rather above, the swamps of sin. As we have seen, Jesus Christ is that way of rest, joy, and power, even as he was the door of entrance. The important thing, however, is to see that the very thing that made him the door makes him the way. It was not his life nor his teaching that made the Lord Jesus the door, but rather it was his cross, his blood, his finished work for sin. It is the same blood and finished work that constitutes him the way for us. It is redemption at the beginning of the Christian life and redemption all throughout the Christian life. This means 
that it's a way on which sin is anticipated, taken account of, and finished even before it has come to existence in us. The worst discoveries we make about ourselves do not take him by surprise. The answer to sin is always there. Indeed, the way himself, Jesus, is the answer. Here the convicted saint need not despair nor feel nagged, for his sin is cleansed and fellowship with God made real through the moment it is confessed. Indeed, he need not regard himself as having slipped off the way through his many sins of ignorance if he gives an immediate and honest assent as soon as God shows them to him and he confesses them. We may therefore call this way the way of the blood. Indeed, in Hebrews, the new and living way into the holy of holies of God's presence is clearly stated to be the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Therefore, even the most self-condemned are bidden to have boldness to draw near by this way, for it is consecrated for just such. Isaiah also prophesies the same comfort of this way as we have seen when he speaks of the way of holiness. He says, The unclean shall not pass over it, but the redeemed shall walk there. Again, that's in Isaiah 35, verses 8 and 9. True, it's titled the way of holiness may at first sound forbidding, and the phrase the unclean shall not pass over it may seem to exclude us. But who does walk there? It does not say those who have never been unclean, or even those who have only seldom been unclean. But it says the redeemed shall walk there. That is, those who on many or few occasions have been defiled by sin, but who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, and who are continually cleansed just as often as may be necessary. This gives people no better than ourselves the chance to walk in daily, hourly fellowship with God and takes from our souls all striving and strain as we do so. For if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. This way is not only the way of the blood, but also the way of repentance. If that which makes Jesus the door, his blood also makes him the way. Then the steps of repentance and faith by which we enter through the door are the constantly reiterated steps by which we walk the way. There are not two messages, one for the unsaved and the other for the saved. It is the same blessed Lord who is presented to both, Hallelujah. And the response which is required from both is that of repentance. It must ever be so when we speak of the blood of Jesus. If his blood, on the one hand, declares that sin is finished for us, it also demands, on the other hand, that sin should be admitted by us. For his blood only cleanses sin confessed as sin. When the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, he added, and the truth, and the life. Those two words do not introduce two entirely new thoughts, but refer back to the way and qualify it. It was as if he were saying, I am the way, which is the way of truth, and which is the way of life. This means that the light of truth is always shining on his highway, continually showing us the truth about ourselves and about our sin, the thoughts and reactions of our hearts, the words of our lips, and the deeds of our hands are all spotlighted as sin by the light of truth. Whenever they are so, and we are required to agree continually with God under this conviction, and repent. This is what John calls walking in the light 
as he, Jesus, is in the light. If we are willing to say yes to God under his light, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If, however, we refuse to say yes and repent, then the walk with Jesus stops. We slip off the highway and we find ourselves in the darkness, which we are so much less able to see in the next time. Very soon, if we still refuse, we shall be struggling again in the swamps. Thank God we can always return to the way the moment that we are willing. The simple steps of repentance and faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus, by which we first entered the door, have only to be repeated, and we are back with him in the light. Again, 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what is meant by Isaiah's phrase when he says, the way of holiness. It is what we may call gospel holiness, the chief element of which is not that sin never comes, but that it is hated and judged and confessed to Jesus immediately when it does come. Then, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, he is made unto us sanctification. That is holiness. He becomes to us what we cannot be in ourselves. We find ourselves possessed with a power that is not ours, and a holiness or sanctification that is not ours either. But it all belongs to him who lives in us. So it is that victory ever comes by repentance coupled with a simple trust in him to be to us what he promises. The glorious fact is that we need not be defeated for any longer than it takes us to recognize sin as sin and bring it to the Lord Jesus in confession immediately. Then he not only cleanses and delivers, but he also becomes himself our victory on that point as we trust him. What is this but continuous revival? The way of truth is found to be the way of life. Most important, this way is simply walking with Jesus himself. The central phrase of Isaiah's prophecy of the highway is that he shall be with them. He is both the way itself and the one who walks beside us on that way, bearing on his shoulders the responsibility of all our affairs. We can go shopping with Jesus, we can go to work with Jesus. We can do the most menial tasks in the house with him and undertake the largest responsibilities in our profession with him. If we are cleansed from our sin as we go, we shall many times a day turn to him to seek his guidance, to ask his help, or simply to praise him for his love and sufficiency. In no part of life are we to be independent of him. His presence is to suffuse everything we do with peace. If in anything that peace is disturbed or shattered, we know that sin has crept in, and we must immediately repent. For the peace that comes from an ungrieved Holy Spirit in our hearts is the arbitrator over all that we do or think. Colossians 3.15 Before leaving this picture of the Lord Jesus as the way, we need to point out its relevance to a matter which is rightly on the hearts of an increasing number of the Lord's people, the matter of the church's need for revival. It is not uncommon to hear of how the Holy Spirit has visited a mission station, a Bible school, or a church in convicting power. Many Christians have been convicted of sin and broken before the Lord Jesus in repentance, and others have been saved for the first time. Hearts have been cleansed in the blood of Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit. Great joy has been in that place, and the fruits of the Spirit have begun to appear in lives. 
After the disturbance of such an experience, sometimes involving the cessation for the time being of the usual routine, normal activities are resumed, albeit at a higher level. However, nobody seems to expect such times of humbling and cleansing to continue. And alas, they do not. Gradually, the new life begins to recede, and the higher level at which all seem to be living seems to drop and disappear. Until not long after that time of outstanding blessing, things are no more different from what they were before. And though perhaps not all their gains are lost, they are nonetheless left with little more than a bright memory which contrasts painfully with the present state of things. And what is true of the experience of a group is often true of the individual who has to lament, where is the blessedness I once knew? So what is going on here? In that time of revival, we were in a crisis experience, a door experience. The Spirit was convicting us. And we saw Jesus as the one who would bring us into peace and victory if we would only repent. But we did not see that the steps of consenting to conviction, brokenness, and repentance which we were taking were not only the door, but also the way which we were to travel ever after. We certainly saw that those humbling steps were necessary to bring us into the state of peace and fellowship with God which we needed but we did not expect to have to repeat them every day. Surely, we thought the blessing we were entering into would last more or less forever. That was just the mistake that we made. Those humbling steps needed to be often repeated. Those steps should have become the habit of our soul. The crisis should have led us onto a walk, and a walk consists of repeated steps, the same steps which we took in the crisis. As we have seen, the Lord Jesus is the way as well as the door, and the steps by which we entered into the door are to be continually repeated if we are to walk the way of peace, power, and rest. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him continually. So says Paul in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. If we are to know his presence and power continually, there will have to be on our part continual willingness for conviction, a continual brokenness before the Lord, a continual repentance, and a continual cleansing from sin in his blood. For sin makes its approach to us constantly. There is no such thing as a static experience of peace and holiness. Momentary, maybe, but never static. Revival, holiness, and victory mean a constant walking with the Lord Jesus. We once asked a missionary from one of the fields in East Africa where revival has been continuing for so many years, what was the leading feature, as he observed it, in the life of the fellowship there. Without a moment's hesitation, he replied, living with Jesus in the now. They were finding the Lord Jesus as the way indeed. And now a word as to recapturing the lost experience. An outstanding experience of being filled with the Spirit can sometimes prove more of a curse to us than a blessing. For if such an experience be lost, the devil uses the memory of it to nag us and to condemn us. That which was ordained to be unto life, we find to be unto death. More than that, the devil uses that past experience to provoke us to try to regain it by the way of works. And we get more and more into darkness and despair as our resolutions to do this or that prove abortive. The way back, however, is simple, so simple that it may and often does elude us. It is simply to take our eyes off the blessings that Jesus gives us, 
to cease to strive to recapture them and to put our eyes on Jesus himself just as we are and where we are. Then he himself will show us what is wrong with our present relationship with him. And as we bow the head in repentance, we find him again. But this time in a capacity more precious than ever before, as our new and living way, involving us in a daily walk with him in repentance and faith. This way may be thought of then variously as the way of the blood or the way of repentance or walking with Jesus or under some other term. They all mean the same thing, however. Christ himself is the way, and thereon his redemption is continually experienced. It is the primitive way of the early church, which has today been lost sight of in the maze of merely human efforts and teachings, and has largely been superseded by the way of works in its various subtle forms. As Jeremiah says, we have been caused to stumble in our ways from the ancient paths, to walk in bypaths in a way that has not been cast up. Jeremiah 18.15 So, bringing our study to a close, we need to rediscover each for himself that ancient path, that path that is the good way, and walk therein continually and then we shall find rest for our souls. Now may the Lord Jesus bless this study to our hearts and give us the strength to obey what we have learned. As he wills and until next time, friends, I love you and I'll see you on the next video.